Welcome back to the Mythic Dungeon International. If you'd like to support the program or the Arena World Championship prize pools for the global finals at the end of the year, be sure to check out the Transmorpher Beacon or Hoarder Alliance Fireworks in-game toys. I'm Jack, and joining me on the desk is Sloot, Tettles, and Zyronic here. As we move on to the upper finals here, taking a look at Battle for Champion versus a company. And Sloot, we've kind of talked a, a lot about tiers for teams. Which team is top tier? Who's a little bit underneath them as we go into this? The company's the third place Eastern team going into it, and at this point, I'm not quite convinced that they're able to step up to Battle for Champions level. I mean, I, I would actually completely agree with that. Battle for Champion is just the, you know, one of those uh, method and a method of U teams of the East right now, and they're just, I mean, they're just performing up to snuff. They had an excellent first series. A company, I mean, certainly won their series. They two owed it, um, and they're they're looking solid as well. But just. You know, you gotta bring it up to that level, kind of step it up to the next level uh, when you're fighting against both Team D and Battle for Champion. Yeah, and taking a look at it, as we go into King's Rest, this has been one dungeon we've always wanted to be able to take a look at and focus on going into this one's ironic. It's a tough dungeon, and Battle for Champion obliterated this one. Yeah, I think we went over it a lot last week, how difficult this 19 tyrannical King's Rest. It's only even more difficult with this Quaking Affix, with that extra damage coming out on those bosses, especially the Golden Serpent first boss. Expect to see a lot of probable deaths on that first boss. Here. But okay, so we're talking about Battle for Champion success that we did see in King's Rest. But with it being this quaking of fix and actually being so scary, what are the likelihood of us seeing like just some mistakes being able to like control the pace and control like whoever ends up winning the matchup? I mean, I mean, we could see, we could even see, because of the difficulty of the affix, like I've mentioned, we could even see Battle for Champion having some spot healer deaths or spot DPS deaths on this boss. And if a healer dies, they've got no battle res for him, so it could be a huge time loss for them. Yeah, that and the, the checkpoints are so annoying to deal with. You know, having to stealth back and being slower as a result of that can definitely be a big pain for them as they go into this matchup here. Very important to look at that, not only for the first game, but as we're moving on, we got a Taldazar and Shrine of the Storm. So looking at Battle for Champion having a big advantage, but what was it here, Tettles, that really just seem to sink uh, their ship in, on the side of company for their time trials. Well, uh, <laughs> can, you speak from, can you speak from experience here? Uh, for, for the side of a company, I actually do think that they're actually a little bit better than they did show in the match previous today. Um, we actually did see a little bit sloppy of a motherload from them, but the first match of the day was actually incredibly clean from them. And, um, and, and then just making sure that they make sure that they do end up making a clean run in the, over the course of this whole entire King's Rest is the most important thing, like we said. I actually don't believe that they'll end up outpacing Battle for Champion in King's Rest, but if Battle for Champion does make some mistakes, they can definitely capitalize. We'll have to be watching their composure going into this battle for champion, the number one seed as we go into it, facing off against a company. Yeah, so I, I mean, just battle for champion on paper titles for sure is meant to be just by far uh, the winner on this. But so many things can go wrong, especially in the tyrannical dungeon uh, such as this. That I mean, just out of nowhere you could have wipes, especially on the golden serpent. And we know how, just how punishing the runs backs are uh, if you do have that wipe. But nonetheless, both teams mass stealthing through straight to the first boss's room as we typically see these two colossi of course keep them in mind they will be pulled back into the gauntlet room after the golden serpent but let's focus on this trash first in this room here uh really dangerous trash really aggressive uh, from some of the pulls that we've seen on the teams previously but i don't think up to this point any team except method used on a full room pull yeah we actually do see on the side of battle for champion they actually end up positioning themselves to pull three packs at the very beginning here with bloodlust they actually end up pulling the whole entire room on the side of battle for champion and on the side of a company they're going for a little bit safer of a pull battle for champions pull here with the explosive and the quaking is actually very scary as we do actually see Jack electing to run Tree of Life here. We've actually seen him be playing Tree of Life an awful lot in the over the course of an MDI, and I actually don't know if it's significantly better, but they're definitely making it work on the side of Battle for Champion. I mean, hey, look, if they have these kind of extremely large pulls right now that you just need a lot of HPS pumped out, 68, 70k, uh, over 70k HPS coming out of Battle for Champion, but finally one of the rogues does dip, and we have a death as well for the Windwalker, and it looks like they bit off more than they can chew right now as the second rogue just hovers around that death, eating so much damage over time from those whirls coming out of the Warriors here. Huge amounts of explosives going off as well, and it looks like like battle for champion starts off in an extremely disastrous manner bit off more than they could chew the high risk was not worth the reward in the end as team of company moves slow and steady through the rest of the room right now battle for champion clawing back to get to that room man that is actually such a scary pull on the side of battle for champion you have to be able to deal with those explosives um, expertly well and once we actually do see one or two deaths coming out of the side of battle for champion it just kind of cascades into a full team wipe by not being able to deal with all those explosives we 
do see on the side of Battle for Champion, they're looking to position themselves in order to be able to start pulling again, while on the side of a company, they're just turtling away, trying to make sure that they do get these safer, more consistent pulls that they are looking to make sure that they are looking to do. Yeah, I mean, you can see why uh, Battle for Champion perhaps achieves such a great time trial on this. If you do get that massive pull off, you're certainly in a great position uh, for the rest of the dungeon, but didn't work out this well for a Battle for Champion, and uh, to be honest, they didn't even kill much of the trash, unfortunately, by the time they died. Only 1% on the board. The tank goes down again. Uh, Buon Samdi's uh, bargain, the trinket, of course, has procced at this point. Don't have that available for another five and a half minutes. One of the rogues goes down again. The Windwalker is down. Battle Res has already been used on the side of the Prot Warrior, who once again goes down. Windwalker gets taken with him, and Jack goes down. Another full team wipe for Battle for Champion, and this is an absolute fiesta on the side of Battle for Champion. Only 1% trash on the board. They're really going to have to buckle down here and start taking it slow and steady, just like Team of Company, who is about to pull the Golden Serpent. Uh, honestly, Titles, at this point, I think they can have a mini vacation before uh, getting back to the boss. We saw a company actually do Reaping without the Golden Serpent here. Um, Lixie wasn't a topped on mana. It was a little bit of a riskier of a pull, and if they were actually sitting there with their second monitor, looking at Battle for Champion's issues that we have seen in this first room of King's Rest, then I would like to take it a little bit slower, too. We actually do see their Bloodlust coming out here on the Golden Serpent. They might have been looking to save it for the Reaping, but they ended up seeing, like, what is actually happening on the side of Battle for Champion and decided, oh, this doesn't have to happen. It doesn't have to happen indeed as Bloodlust does come up. Ten seconds left in just a moment there for Team of Company. 80% on the Golden Serpent. Now, Golden Serpent uh, mechanics not too difficult to deal with, but the main thing you have to watch out for is, of course, the damage over time that plagues one of the players, uh, coating them in blood. You will have to drop off that uh, pool of gold on the edge by the time it expires. Now, they only have one of the small GUIs available on their side. Usually that Lustrous Call happens every three uh, animated uh, golds, but because of a pre-immuning from the rogues, they're actually fortunate enough to avoid two of them entirely so uh, well played by them for team of company making their life easier further in the fight they won't have to deal with quite as many as them battle for champion uh, looks like white number three has now plagued the team uh, we are at 16 deaths on the board as jack has stealth and is uh you know moderately at a moderate <laughs> at a moderate pace returning back to that first boss's room yeah jack we see you running around uh Jack B. Rejuven over here. So, in on the side of the company, we actually do see them dealing with the Golden Serpent in a decent manner. The boss is down to 50%. This boss is obviously super scary because when it, if you do get a bad lineup with the Quaking and that Liquid Gold Dot, then we actually could see people starting to go down. As we do actually see people get super low from that Quaking on a company, while the Animated Golds start trickling closer and closer to the Golden Serpent. If the Animated Golds do um, get contact with the Golden Serpent's hitbox, it will end up giving him a shield. And we actually do see the tank goes out, down on the side of a company, but they do end up having a battle res here. Um, um, it ends up being at an okay time to be able to res him, and you actually do see the Windwalker Monk go down the side of a company. Yeah, the Prowler does immediately charge back in and take out the explosive that has spawned under the Golden Serpent during that little hiccup. They're going to have to finish the rest of this fight as a four-man group for the remaining 37%, and uh, I mean, eventually the healer just does run out of man on this fight. That uh, that damage over time can add up to quite a bit, not to mention the tank death. Uh, another fairly aggressive large pull coming in here for Battle for Champion. Uh, they figure that 498th time's the charm, so they should be able to pull it off for the rest of the room, but a lot of struggles coming up for them as they look to kind of dip around the corner and have line of sight for any orbs that might get a bit out of hand. But the problem is, you know, it's not even just the tank death titles, but the rogues and the windwalker are eating so much excessive damage from those whirling tornadoes that come out of the uh, the warriors, and they just get so much damage, uh, frost damage through that um, AOE and the whirl. So just it makes the healer's life so difficult, especially when the tank is absolutely getting crushed by those champions. Yeah, it also looked like their initial strategy for the pull looked like it. Did it to be to like move around the middle area line of sighting a lot of the explosive orbs and we actually did just see a couple people end up um, dropping down super low getting killed by the explosives with the tornado combo and then they end up just um, falling down losing damage on the explosive orbs and then just end up wiping multiple and multiple times as we see on the side of battle for champion for a company they've been actually looking like they've uh, done my team a good tribute in four manning the golden serpent hopefully uh, Lixie doesn't end up running out of mana and they end up wiping here Lixie getting super low there with that debuff and he might end up going down here, but he ends up um, getting high enough health, and he ends up being okay with after that liquid gold cast. We do see um, the Lucre's Call animating those golds there as they do start walking towards the Golden Serpent. But something to be noting of is with the Windwalker Monk down, they do no, not longer have access to a Ring of Peace. So that's actually kind of a way that you would otherwise be able to keep the animated golds at bay. And the animated golds are getting so Ooh. close to the boss there. That's exactly what Ugh. I was about to say. That was really scary. So if one of those uh, animated golds does get soaked into the boss, it will gain a pretty substantial absorb 
along with the damage increase as long as that absorb remains uh, up on the boss. So really well done by then, by, by that one rogue to sit in there and make sure to Blade Flurry and cleave all of those mobs coming in uh, as to not essentially proc a wipe for the team. So 6% uh, now on the boss for Team of Company. Battle for Champion, you know, at this point, they're, uh, of course, substantially behind, but I wouldn't count them as fully out. If they kind of keep up with these very aggressive pulls that they have proven at least that they're able to do in the time trial and go through the rest of the dungeon and we kind of know the caliber of uh, team that they are they could very well catch team a company a team that has had to do 40 percent of the boss four man at this point we also have another cheat death proc out of ds here for team a company so might come down closer than you think in the end as lexi does go down for the final two percent of the boss fortunately it was low enough to be able to finish off but now the wind walker the only other person who could have res the healer is dead already so lexi will have to release and run back uh kind of sinking even more time for Team Company. Yeah, we actually do see on the side of Battle for Champion, they have the Golden Serpent down to 60% health. Unfortunately, there is a 13 death differential separating the two teams, so that's that's a bit of a monumentous um, mountain to climb back from. As long as Team Company ends up playing it slow and steady like we did see, they look like they might be in okay, but for the side of Battle for Champion, they just need to make sure that they're putting themselves in position to be able to capitalize on the company's mistakes, like four manning the Golden Serpent for 40%. Yeah, exactly, and, and like I'm saying, I don't think they're as far behind as you think. I know it looks mm -hmm. very daunting. It certainly won't be easy for them to catch up. They're not guaranteed to do so in any way, but 40% on the Golden Serpent for Battle for champion now as they look to chew through the rest of the help uh, the health as a full five-man team uh, team of company has started on the gauntlet here the four kings gauntlet uh, that they will need to get uh, through before they're able to progress from this room now uh, most teams that we see especially in the west will opt to pull those two colossi at the beginning that i had mentioned the two constructs on top of this trash and proc their second reaping with it so we'll see if they do that uh, here on the side but uh, they do unfortunately one of the constructs casts this massive cone frontal right on the group which which is, uh, does an immense amount of damage and stuns you in place. So the warrior goes down. They don't have the battle as available. Came over from the boss. Uh, HT goes down the rogue and Lexi as well. And it looks like it's going to be a full wipe. Exactly what Battle for Champion was hoping for to come out of Team of Company as they now rush back to get uh, to Gauntlet. And uh, Battle for Champion looking to pounce on it and capitalize on this mistake with 13% uh, left on the Golden Serpent. Definitely looking to battle back as chat spamming probably lull at this point. Well, <laughs> Maybe even does, Lull W. Lull W as a company does actually get those two animated guardians casting on their tank. Their tank just ends up standing in the stun, getting stunned and then instantly killed by all of the mobs that he was face tanking. On the side of Battle for Champion, the Golden Serpent looks like it's going down here and Battle for Champion battling back, making sure that they just stayed in the game and putting themselves in a position, like you were saying, to just be able to capitalize on the stage. And right on cue, that 13 death difference <laughs> has turned into an 8 death difference uh, between the two teams. Battle for Champion now starting their gauntlet as a company has restarted. So certainly at this point, a company still ahead, even just by uh, sheer death volume. But Battle for Champions starting it up right away. And it looks like another stun comes in on the Pro Warrior for Team of Company. Fortunately, Lex <laughs> manages to pump enough heals into him. Almost the exact same mistake that had cost them their previous wipe. Uh, wipe was about to deja vu onto the team. But Team of <laughs> Company manages to recover as Tettles has a good old chuckle here. Uh, Battle for Champion just looking to chew through this trash as expected. Yeah, Deja Vu strikes twice whenever the tank does get hit by the lightning once more. Um, making sure that he does not stand in that frontal cone while they do end up killing um, the king here is very important. On the side of Battle for Champion, we do also see them dealing with these Guardians not getting stunned. Uh, <laughs> very important to a, note a here. key to success, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> uh, I guess the saying is lightning doesn't strike twice, but maybe it does for Team of Company here. Oh. Uh, DS uh, dipping quite low there. Doesn't have that cheat death available, but fortunately no death for side of company here as the warrior just dealing with a fair bit of damage, looking to proc their second round of reaping, something that Battle for Champion will actually likely beat them to. So at this point, Battle for Champion certainly in a good uh, position to perhaps retake the lead that we saw them have so viciously um, in the previous series that they uh, had won to nothing. Uh, both of their animated guardians will uh, cast a kind of soft enrage at 50%, increase of their attack speed and haste by 50%. Which is why we see them so maniacally and quickly swinging onto the Prot Warrior for a battle for champion. Team doing well, of course, to sidestep that cone as Team of Company is now at 37% on the trash and will be proccing their fourth, uh, excuse me, their um, second reaping wave momentarily at 40%. Yeah, so something to actually note about this pack that a company is pulling is the uh, King ends up casting a Lightning Rod cast. It can, after it does do its first tick, it can be knocked or displaced in order to cancel it. And then the Guard Captain also does a Whirling Axe debuff that will go on the whole entire party.
party unless it is line of sight or something. Um, overall, I think on a tyrannical affix, you don't really need to be looking to line of sight that guard captain during the whirling axe, but it is definitely avoidable damage that ends up getting your group entirely low. If we actually did see like an explosive orb or something like that ending up going off, we could actually see a wipe on the side of a company, but they do end up dealing with that pack expertly well. On the side of Battle for Champion, we do actually see their second reaping of the instance coming through here while a company does proc theirs as well. Yep, and Jack, of course, popping that tree of life for him. His bark is worse than his bite, as we've learned in previous expansions. Battle for Champion now 43% on the board, cleaning up their second reaping and getting ready to deal with uh, what I believe will be uh, almost their last round of the gauntlet. There, of course, are four separate uh, kings or queens that they have to deal with in the gauntlet uh, before they can progress past this room. So looking to get rid of that as uh, Queen Wasi is about to be uh, destroyed and killed here. But the problem is they still have the king up, who is just so annoying to kill with a full melee comp because of his constant blade storming around the room that does an immense amount of damage. Uh, of course, on Team of Company on the right side, we have seen that one of the Shadow Smashes from the Lost Souls is unfortunately connected with the face of not only the Prot Warrior, but also the Windwalker Monk. That is a one-minute debuff that decreases your maximum health by 20%. So for the Windwalker, you know, could spell a bit of trouble later, but certainly not something you want to see on your tank. Yeah, and it looks like on the side of Battle for Champion, they've actually passed Team of Company somehow. Uh, we do see a company still dealing with this king right here, while we do see Battle for Champion India um, pulling the Queen and the Raptor here. Yeah, so Team of Company, uh, King Timology is just about to fall here, um, and they're about to start on the same queen that Battle for Champion is on. So Battle for Champion indeed ahead, but still has that eight death difference to go uh, over the team. So the team's actually kind of neck and neck at this point, which is uh, shocking and or appalling, considering the ridiculous start that Battle for Champion had at the start of this dungeon, uh, just piling on the death. So, uh, you know, I got to say, really impressive from here, uh, from Battle for Champion here, to have that kind of horrible start to a dungeon, and then mentally recompose yourself and just get ready to plow the rest of the dungeon exactly like you've proven to do in the time trial. So we'll have to see exactly how this dungeon ends up, but uh, very impressive from them here so far. Yeah, we actually do see on the side of Battle for Champion, they end up popping their shroud and sh uh, shrouding past that construct while we do see on the side of a company. They're finally dealing with that rafter and they end up making their way down the same hallway as Battle for Champion. Battle for Champion here popping their Lightfoot potion and looking to pull all of the embalming fluids together. It is important to know that on an explosive affix that we do see in King's Rest currently, that this whole entire room of embalming fluids is actually Actually very scary. Yes, this will be an ooey gooey rich and chewy pull coming out of these gooeys on the side. Lots of explosives going down, a lot of babysitting needed. If one of those goes off, it's just going to spiral and snowball into a horrible effect. But these absolutely get deleted uh, by the DPS put out from Battle for Champions, so not even a concern from them. One explosive actually does leak there, it had like 2% health left <laughs> on it. Nobody really felt like dealing with it. Let it explode, no problem, as they bring the internment construct over to the, its uh, brethren on the other side of the room, looking to make sure that they're close to the tomb or the sarcophagus on the side. That is where one of the players will get sent and you have to with the entomb and you have to spam click it to release them. Now, it's going to be important for them to either bounce between the two tombs or make sure it tettles that they desynchronize the cast of those entombs from the constructs. Yeah, making sure that they're desynced so that people do not go into the tomb at the exact same time is very important. On the side of a company, we did actually see their tank go down while they did, in fact, try to get past that one construct. They're, um, they're forcing to waste time casting mass res and get the tank back up. While on the side of Battle for Champions, they're dealing with these two constructs with their entomb incredibly well. Something that I wanted to point out on the side of Battle for Champion is um, the fact that they just chain pulled the constructs into the very bottom part of that embalming fluid, as we do actually see the tank for the side of a company actually taking a little while to res up here. Yeah, so having a bit of struggle there for a team of company as they uh, work to fix out those issues. Battle for Champion has now procced their third reaping wave and wasting no time has aggressively pulled it into Machimba the Embalmer, the second boss of the dungeon, one that particularly hits tanks very, very very hard. Uh, of course, Prot Warrior is definitely up to the task of dealing with that, with Shield Ball being a uh, shield, a block being as strong as it is. Jack already popping that Tree of Life in order to get all those hots and that excess healing rolling on the increasing damage coming out of the second boss, but also the wave of uh, third reaping that is about to invade. Yeah, and on the side of a company, obviously, the sky, their tank is still not res, so, so they end up just wasting a lot of time to have a, a very close match that they uh, can't afford to be wasting. For the side of Battle for Champion, I honestly wonder if they would have been a little bit better off holding this Bloodlust for the double Berserker pack and trying to pull a little bit bigger as we do actually see our full screen coming in on the side of Battle for Champion here. Um, you know, hard to say. 
We'll have to see. It doesn't matter because <laughs> the other team doesn't have an active tank right now. Uh, but uh, we've seen both strategies come out uh, of various teams in both the East and West. Mm -hmm. We've had a strategy come out where they just want to get through this boss as quickly as possible. Sometimes Bloodlust even comes up with 40% left on Machimba, and we see some teams do that. Um, but certainly the Bloodlust on the trash coming right after this has often allowed teams to be slightly more aggressive with the Berserker packs. A company is now back in full shape as they do a full embalming fluid room pull just like Battle for Champion had done earlier earlier, making sure to well babysit those explosives. Anytime one of those explosives does go off, which spawns randomly from creatures, it will damage anybody in line of sight of them for 50% of their max health. That's a lot of damage. Yeah, that is a lot of damage. Obviously, it's okay if you do only have one go off, but the issue with the pull as big as this embalming fluid pull is if you end up accidentally having multiple go off or not coordinating it as well as you otherwise should, then you need to definitely make sure that you do end up having um, those explosives dealt with well. You actually do see Jack on the side of Battle for Champion um, getting out the, their player out of that entomb from the sarcophagus there and, and making sure that they he does get back in melee in order to be able to DPS down Machimba. We actually do, he did, uh, Sloot did note that Machimba actually melees incredibly hard, so maybe focusing more on DPS may not be Jack's cup of tea here, but we actually do see Jack doing a pretty sizable amount of damage for Arrested Druid on this pull. Yeah, Drain Fluid does go down on one of the rogues and uh, his dehydrated debuff there uh, actually leaves you in a situation where you uh, move slower and I believe do less damage as well mm -hmm. until you're healed above 90%. So a bit of a grievous style effect on them as we finally see that 90% threshold kick in and uh, the debuff does disappear from the rogue here for Battle for Champion. Uh, the room being filled up with these flame patches. Now, it's important these flame patches actually do tick on top Time zero. So the moment that patch hits the ground, it does an immense amount of damage, especially in this tyrannical setting. So players doing well to immediately move out of that and finding themselves in the corner for the next flame patch. Now, I like what they're doing here, Tettles. They're kind of pre-positioning the boss near the exit to save those precious seconds. So as soon as Machimba is dead, they're already up the stairs towards the bridge trash. They actually really did get a lucky entomb there with it being on the near side of Machimba. All they planned. Had... Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Battle for Champion knew where the entomb was going, so they were planning it in advance. Um, something also to notice that you can actually shadow meld or vanish or cloak off that drain fluid as well if you do have those available to you. And it saves your healer a little bit of healing. It also saves you um, a lot more time in, in order for you to not have that um, debuff on you for pro a prolonged periods of time. On the side of a company, we have seen them do their reaping in a Machimba pull, and they, they obviously pop blood loss on the side of uh, a company as well. Yes, Battle for Champion, they end up... No, uh, they end up uh, going into this double pull. They end up doing the double Berserker pack with the Hex Priests without Bloodlust, which is something that we uh, haven't seen yet. Yeah, this is scary, scary. We've seen it from a couple teams in the West. Hex Priest Spectral Bolt absolutely rips tanks apart. Uh, not to mention, of course, the infamous Berserkers. Uh, they do just a really nasty rend bleed or damage over time physical on the tank. That does stack up indefinitely. It's a 10 second duration, and they will often recast it at eight seconds into the bleed, so two seconds left off of it. So very important for uh, members of the team to have help peel for the tank as three stacks is on their pro warrior right now finally manages to heal through the last take it actually opted the tree of life to uh, be forced out of jack there to make sure it keeps the tank healthy you can see just how dangerous that bleed is so i was just about to say it's very important for the team mm -hmm. members to try and stun or do anything to those berserkers before they're able to reapply the stack on their current target uh, the warrior of course could just run away but then somebody else will have to eat the bleed to the face so don't want to deal with that brute here getting his ground crush in as we get the bump from the ring of peace team being very trusted here to make sure that the brute gets displaced. Jack gets unfortunately caught up, <laughs> decides to hang up on the ceiling, see what's going on here. Unfortunately, no treasure there as he decides to get right back down and heal the rest of the team. He might have not just had uh, Typhoon up or something, because if you actually do knock the Brute, you can actually cancel that ground cush cast. But we did see uh, Jack and the Rogue actually getting knocked up there. Something that's also important to note is we have seen Rogues in the past um, running Dwarf for the um, for the racial there in order to be able to get off that Berserker bleed. But we do see um, the Rogues on the side of Battle for Champion electing to not be using that. For the side of a company, they do have Machimba the Embalmer down to 25% here. And uh, we do actually see them getting a Drain Fluid cast on their Windwalker Monk on the side of a company there. And Battle for Champion, I mean, I Outside of their just disastrous start to the dungeon, just moving really, really well right now. I spoke a bit too early as the, the warrior dips down to 9% health there. A lot of damage, a lot of, a lot of residual damage coming in on his, uh, the team as their fourth reaping wave has procced, and a ton of these grave bolts are just leaking out from the side area, hitting various members of the party for 25% of their maximum health. And we have these frost shocks going out to random team members as well from the witch doctor that not only slow you for 12 seconds by 50%, but also just do a huge amount of frost spike damage. But well well kited there by the Prot Warrior tank to get away, get those stacks reset and uh, dispelled off by Jack as they come back in, doing well to dodge these green swirlies and move over to the remaining trash of the uh, bridge here. A company 5% finally on Machimba. I, 
I feel like this kill has taken them a very long time. Achimba only down to 4% now, about to fall over for a company. And uh, unfortunately, the prot warrior here has uh, taken a bit of a tumble <laughs> off the side of the bridge. He shall not pass as he gets punted down the side and an absolute disaster here. It did indeed speak too soon for Battle for Champion as a poison goes out all over the team. Both Jack and the prot warrior are dead and it looks like it's going to be another full team wipe here for Battle for Champion who has their a checkpoint at the beginning of the dungeon, something that we talked about earlier on the death titles, how brutal these <laughs> oh checkpoints are. This is a tragedy. So basically, that Beastmaster ends up casting an ability. It's called Dead Eye Shot. <laughs> we do see Jack getting feared across the map here. So the Beastmasters do cast a Dead Eye Shot, and it'll knock players back. We actually did see the tank on the side of Battle for Champion getting knocked back and knocked off the ledge here, as we do see a company here um, getting dangerously low as they do do the double Beastmaster pull here, trying to make sure that they are still in the match while we do see Jack on the side of Battle for Champion running back through the instance, trying to get the rest of his group mass res as quickly as possible. Now, I mean, at this point, the entirety of the dungeon is clear to them, uh, except for the purifying construct in the middle of the bridge. Now, if you don't kill that purifying construct, we haven't had to talk about this before, but now, <laughs> now that we're in the situation, if you don't kill the purifying construct, uh, sorry, if you do kill him, you will actually have a checkpoint in the form of a little flight path that goes down to the mid bridge there, but uh, not available to them. We can see that purifying construct just ahead of Battle for Champions healer Jack as he stealths and runs around the side. Team a company once again looking to recapitalize on this situation as they move through this uh, very dangerous spectral mob hall that we just saw earlier. Here comes the daunting brute in front of them that we saw Battle for Champion deal with earlier and Jack unfortunately get knocked up into the ceiling with. Uh, they grab that, the Beastmaster, and of course the two Raptors. Not too dangerous on the side there, uh, looking for a similar pull to Battle for Champion. Just trying to catch up here, but once again, that death difference has now been reboosted up to 12 titles. Yep, and we do actually see Jack make it all the way back, um, finally getting a range in order to be able to mass res his friends on the side of Battle for Champion while a company just continuously chugging along, making sure that they're putting themselves in a position to let Battle for Champion throw the match back to them. Um, on the side of Battle for Champion, they really need to make sure that they don't get knocked off by the Deadeye shot for the Beastmaster here, as it is like one of the only ways that they can end up wiping on that trash pack. I, you know, based on the time we live in, this is certainly the Game of Thrones. It is as popular. Uh, everybody's excited about that. A company here, 75% on trash. They will be proccing their fourth reaping wave, similar to how we saw for Battle for Champion. Uh, we'll see exactly how aggressive they decide to be with this as a Battle for Champion returns to the uh, ever-daunting Beastmaster pack that had initially caused them this damage and uh, grief quite earlier. 90% on the board for Battle for Champion as they make sure this time to not have their back off of the edge of the bridge and not get punched by the Beastmaster, hopefully, uh, for a second time. Battle for Champion, 92% on the board. They will likely want to save their fifth Reaping proc for after Shadow of Zul, so that they can just Shadow Meld it off in the final boss's room. But first, uh, we haven't gotten to the third boss yet, Tettle, so uh, we'll see that in just a moment as Team of Company now deals with their fourth Reaping wave. Yeah, we actually did see on side of Battle for Champion, they used two blinds on the Hex Priest and that Berserker in order, because they don't really end up needing it. They're only going to get their last couple of count from the Shadow for Zul. So we do see Battle for Champion Shadow Melding through, and they end up pulling Cooler the Butcher here on this council fight. While we do see on the side of a company, they end up dealing with their uh, fourth reaping of the instance here. Yeah, I mean, Kula, uh, this is a, a, a sort of triad boss fight, but it is sequential, so you will deal with one boss at a time. It's always spawned in the same uh, in the same pattern, at least for the sake of the tournament realm, so that the players have a, an equally easy and predictable time dealing with it. Windwalker does go down for the side of Team of Company, and so does the healer, Lexi. Yes, proxy death as well. No healer available. Explosives litter the battleground right now as the tank holds on and does not hold on any longer goes down as well ds follows suit and we just have one rogue remaining ht about to go down doing what he can to clean up the rest of this reaping pack but the quaking is about to hit him and finish him off as well so a full team wipe here from a company as they cosplay battle for champions <laughs> issues earlier on the bridge now back to the task at hand battle for champion uh, on this uh, kind of triad boss here but uh cool i would say title is definitely the most dangerous of the three bosses. Yeah, it puts a pretty sizable physical debuff on you. In addition to that, you do have the Whirling Axe cast, which end up spinning around the room. Getting hit by them also puts a, a pretty sizable bleed on you, but you, um, the really big debuff is that Severing Axe that we did actually just see um, go out on the Rogue on the side of Battle for Champion. We actually did see Jack pop his Tree of Life a little bit earlier in order to be able to deal with the first um, um, Severing Axe there, but no longer has cooldowns available, making sure that that Rogue stays high health, and worrying about um, Quaking is actually important here, because Quaking, if it ends up locking Jack out, it could make that rogue go down. While they do have two battle reses still, even though they've 
thrown the match a couple times, uh, they they would be okay if that Rogan did in fact actually go down. It's hard to battle res a tank that's 400 yards away off the edge of the bridge, <laughs> so uh, that, they're kind of forced into having those. Nonetheless, uh, Zanazala, the second boss to spawn here. It is a set spawn rotation for the uh, sake of tournament integrity and uh, the tournament realm that we deal with here. So Zanazala will always be the second one, spamming lightning bolts on top of the tank that need to be interrupted, and then occasionally this poison nova as well. Now, should this go off, it's actually quite detrimental to the team and will likely wipe you. Now, after that, the main ability is Call of the Elements, will he spawn, where he will spawn in a uh, diamond or square formation, four totems around the room. The most important one to kill immediately is that explosive one, else it will wipe your group, and then the earth wall after that to kind of limit the amount of absorbs that go out on the boss titles. Yeah, so basically once that earth wall does get killed, um, the boss will no longer be getting the absorbs. And then like the tremor totem, or the torrent totem, and then the earth shock totem are obviously not super important. Um, the torrent totem just kind of is an area denial effect while the lightning totem ends up locking out uh, casters in the group. Obviously the only caster on the side of Battle for Champion is that healer Jack. Obviously him getting locked out from quaking or that earth shock totem is not exactly what you're looking to do. On the side of a company, they're finally getting their mass res off and looking to recoup a little bit uh, in, a, in a series of throws between the two teams here. And Battle for Champion getting Zanzal down to 14% here. Yeah, important to note on this boss as well, once you kill one of the members of this council, it will actually come back occasionally as a ghost to cast its signature mm -hmm. ability on you. So in the form of uh, Kula, she will come back, cast her axes in the middle of the room that we just saw, and Zanzal will port randomly, the ghost form of him at least, will port to random parts of the room and cast that poison nova. So especially in an all melee composition, mm -hmm. you want to make sure that you're on top of that. So somebody needs to kind of pay attention to what's going on in the room and quickly move over if he's not in a very favorable position. Team of Company now with a rather aggressive pull here on the bridge. As we see once again, the Prowl Warrior jump out to safety, not getting uh, too much damage on him. One of the bleeds from the Berserker is up right now, but the Windwalker does go down again as one of the explosives goes off. DS does not have Cheat Death available, so the heal gets pumped into him right away as the Prowl Warrior waits patiently on the side for the Berserker to come to him. Now there is one of these healing tide totems down from the mobs that will pulse continual healing onto the enemies. Poison goes out on the Prowl Warrior tank, who finally gets killed off by the rest of the pack. Battle Rest comes up immediately, but all over the place, there's no threat for the, these mobs right now as they try to clean up and kill the rest of the group. DS goes down as well. Hex gets one of the Frost Shocks on him, and an explosive goes off as well, and we see another Healing Tide Totem go down, barely hanging on as the final nail in the coffin. <laughs> uh, Quaking tries to finish them off, but they manage to hang on right now. I'm not sure if they're going to be able to actually stabilize and finish this off. All of the damage titles that they're trying to do to this group is spent killing explosives that are just constantly popping up all over this place. This is an absolute nightmare for them. Battle for Champion finally cruising <laughs> along, though. 35% on Akali, the third and final boss of this council fight. Yeah, and uh, Akali ends up doing a barrel through cast, which you end up having to have um, group soaked, and he also does a debilitating backhand, which puts a pretty sizable physical debuff on your tank, which you end up not it, normally kind of, you end up like running away from. On the side of a company, it looks like they might end up being able to recover this. Um, one of the biggest issues for a company on the side of that pull was the healing tide totem just ended up staying alive for so long, healing up the Berserker and the Witch Doctor, because um, otherwise they would already be dead. And we actually do see uh, people going down on the side of a company as it looks like it's going to be a full wipe on their side. Yeah, they just ran out of gas. I mean, between, there's there's one DPS member left, and let's say the Prowl Warrior that can help as well. The healer is busy pumping heals. There's Frost Shocks and Bleeds going out from these Berserkers nonstop. In the meantime, there's healing tide totems going down. There's explosive totems going down, uh, explosives going down as well. So the ro between just those two, the Rogue and the Warrior are completely caught, having to DPS. The mobs don't die at all, get a couple of pulses of healing as well, and eventually they just run out of gas and go down again. Uh, now there's only a one death difference, surprisingly, as the tank does go down for Battle for Champion. Won't have that Bon Somdi's Bargain Trinket available until later. Jack gets the Revitalize up on the other side of the bridge, and they move towards the last trash mob, but definitely the most tra dangerous trash mob uh, of the instance, Shadow of Zul here. Yeah, Shadow of Zul is actually incredibly scary for your tank. Um, most of the time, it, since it is a tyrannical weak and non-fortified weak, and then it, like, even though it does have Quaking Sense, it's not a Fortified Week, it's actually, Shadow Zul is not super scary. He ends up casting Shadow Barrage on the highest threat target, most of the time ends up being your tank, and, he, and your tank ends up needing to layer cooldowns in an expert way in order to be able to mitigate it, as it is a pretty hefty dot. The only way that we should actually see the tank go down on the side of Battle for Champion is if for some reason there ends up being a really bad Quaking overlap, and he gets a couple of those stacked on top of him, as we do actually see Quaking go down. Um, on, the side of the, on the side of Battle for Champion, we actually do see one of their rogues getting a debuff as well. He's going to end up running 
want to get out of the group in order to be able to mitigate AoE group damage taken, and then you end up rooting it or purging that mob in some way. Um, obviously, we don't have purges on the side of Battle for Champion, but the minion of Zul does get blinded out there. Yeah, just blinded and left alone. You can DPS your healed, and then it will immediately die. Uh, the reason I was kind of snickering to myself there for a second is, uh, unfortunately, another, like, spot random death coming up for Team of Company as uh, HT, the rogue, was already quite low, and Quaking finished him off as they were running back. He was just not in range of the healer at all, so uh, just make, wanting to make it a nice even 22 deaths on the board so we don't have to keep talking about this death differential between the two teams. 22 apiece right now. Shadow of Zul finally going down for Battle for Champion, giving them their last 100% uh, uh, and reaping wave proc, but uh, just the last second, unfortunate cheat death proc from one of the two rogues is going to leave him a bit vulnerable for the upcoming fight here. Uh, a rather lengthy fight as well in this tyrannical setting for King Dazar has, I mean, essentially four phases. Two raptors, uh, a phase one, and then, of course, the 40% trap phase titles. Yeah, this is the reason that we most of the time end up seeing groups uh, saving Bloodlust for Dazar as opposed to using it at other points of the instance. Um, you're going to end up using it whenever Dazar in does end up getting mounted up, as that is actually a pretty scary point for your tank. Um, overall, this fight during Quaking is actually pretty scary because if your um, tank does get feared during that quaking, while he does have that blade combo on him, he could end up going down there. Uh, a company just more struggles for them right now as two other uh, two more deaths kind of uh, well accompanied the team. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually not a, meant to do that that time, but uh, another two deaths for the team right now as they struggle to uh, kind of skip past that purifying construct, the one that guards the bridge that we see. Uh, pretty much all teams uh, skip these days. Sometimes it's combined with trash into Machimba's room, but nonetheless not uh, something we saw from the two teams there. King Dazar has spawned Raban at 80%. Uh, not really a very dangerous Raptor. Just kind of runs around once in a while and uh, cleaves in front of him with hunting leaps in spot directions. He just sidestep it, no other danger, and uh, can provide actually a bit of damage uh, through revenge procs for the Prot Warrior tank. So might as well just leave him up and then get ready with your cooldowns and, of course, Bloodlust at 60% uh, when uh, Tala, I believe it is, Tala or Tali, mm -hmm. uh, the Raptor comes out, the Mounted Raptor, so that you burn through that as quickly as possible and end that AoE fear phase. Yep, and we do see Lust come out on the side of Battle for Champion as they do push King Dazar and Raban down here. Um, this fight, honestly, is only super scary for the healer because the uh, Dazar actually does do a quaking leap and he does a pretty sizable amount of damage onto the whole entire group so making sure that Jack uses a bunch of his mana in order to be able to top up the group is very important as you do see Jack here getting that quaking leap um, going in bear form and then getting quaked as well uh, at the same time double quaking uh, and then we do see the uh, Tazala end up coming out on the side of battle for champion we actually only see it on like the back half of their bloodlust which ends up it could end up being super scary here for the tank um, the tank, uh, fortunately, can't get out of one, of one of them because of Berserking for uh, that Warriors half, so it is a bit useful there. But Tree of Life, nonetheless, should keep them all quite nice and healthy. As Solid just, I, I mean, they just cut through like one <laughs> butter. It's no problem for them. Kindy's Guard now, a bit of a snooze phase here until we reach 40%. At 40%, he will have uh, traps around the room, spears that fall from the ceiling in one of two patterns. One will start at this Golden River here and move in a clockwise fashion around the room. Very easy for players to dodge just by sidestepping. And the second one, equally easy, really, uh, more of a checkers pattern. So some patches of the room will be not safe and you have to move out of the swirlies and some will be safe after which they will flip flop what's safe and what isn't but a bit early and a bit overzealous getting back into the room right now at a horrible time as the blade combo does go down along with that huge hit on the group fortunately they have three battle reses available jack wastes no time and reses the prot warrior immediately so they could get back into action so that could have been pretty disastrous there but get, uh, got back into the group just a bit too early with that quaking leap whilst the blade combo which is a very heavy tank hit was going on and just kind of finish that prot warrior off. Yeah, it looked like one of the rogues ended up grappling back into the group just a second too early with that quaking leap, making their warrior tank go down, like you said. And then on the side of, uh, you actually do see their tank go down again. Um, fortunately enough, they do end up having another battle res left available. One left in case he does want to go down. Third times the charm, <laughs> uh, Maybe fourth right. times the charm if they end up having another battle res that they end up wanting to use here. But fortunately enough, it is only like, the blade combo is like only a tank ability, and the tank is the only one that's really in a lot of danger here. So having that battle res, as long as it's not your healer that's going down, is going to be okay, but obviously not what you're looking to see if you're on the side of Battle for Champion. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly pretty scary. Uh, you know, you saw those tornadoes going around the arena. They do kind of uh, fixate a player, go to a player, and then uh, set, uh, sit in a set lane, circular lane around the room. Uh, add a, quite a nasty damage over time effect if uh, they should hit you. King Desar here at 10%, though. Yeah, and we do actually see Dazar getting incredibly low while on the side of a company. They're getting Kula the Butcher, the first boss of the council fight, uh, to 24%. But overall, uh, you're not coming back from this Battle for Champion, battling back with 24 deaths here 20, in King's Rest. And 24 deaths apiece for the two teams, and I haven't seen such an elaborate retelling of There Will Be Blood in quite a while, Jack. <laughs>
but nonetheless, 1-0 uh, up in the series right now for Battle for Champion. But that, uh, Jack, that was not looking like the team we know. Battle for Champion narrowly missing the deplete here to take a game one on probably the bloodiest King's Rest we've ever seen here, it's ironic. Yeah, you said there will be blood. I'm thinking more Game of Thrones. I mean, this was... <laughs> it was as, as entertaining as it was to watch. This was just kind of miserable execution from, from both teams. It reminded me a lot of the uh, weekly pug I did for my, my weekly chest last week. <laughs> uh, but man, and, and that's why nobody plays with him. <laughs> oh, oh my god! Uh, but I mean, we okay. The interesting thing that I think for, on the on the side of Battle for Champion here is they attempted this big first room pull multiple times in this dungeon, and we didn't see that out of them last week in the, in the first MDI, MDI Cup. So I wonder if that's sort of an innovation that they're trying to make, or it could be that they're being compared to Team D so much that they just kind of felt like they had to do the same poll as them. But, I mean, we see Battle for Champion pulling in a company against a company, winning the dungeon with more than 20 deaths. They, <laughs> both, both teams having more than 20 deaths and going out in particularly spectacular fashion here. And at this point, it was just which way? I, at, at that point, I actually thought two deaths on the Czar at the very end of this loot. I thought they were just going to full on wipe at the end. Uh, I mean, that, I thought that, we'd see Bob Salami. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, almost, but no Bon Salami no bon this time. But, you know, I, I mean, Tettles and I were kind of joking about it at the end. They have one battle res left, but but shortly after their second battle res there, he actually dipped quite low again, and they were crowding themselves in a corner with uh, some of the traps coming down from the king. But it was just, I mean, you know, Tina Company, you kind of alluded to before the series, you know, we don't really know what's going to come out of them, which version of the team are we getting. But certainly I did not expect this from Battlefront Champion, especially after the, like, immensely dominant dominant time trial that they had in this dungeon. So it just wasn't their day in this dungeon, but they managed to kind of squeeze out the 1-0 anyways. They did get that. And let's let's take a look at this. Zyronic, which wipe are we going over here? Uh, we're going <laughs> to go over the first one. So I think for okay. the viewers at home, you might be wondering what it takes to wipe. As we see here, the tank is kiting far enough away, and he actually LOSs both of these Witch Doctors on the left side of the screen. These Death Leech he'll cast on this DPS. It takes out one of the rogues and one of the monks. And with you, when you have two DPS down, you can't finish the rest of the pull. These small things definitely make up these huge wipes. Now, of course, we also did see on the side of Team and Company after this, they did end up also having a wipe in this room where both the tank and one of his viewers go down to that frontal smash. And they just, uh, you can't have these small mistakes in this tournament. It's not okay. It was certainly, certainly <laughs> not okay as we went into that. And it, it almost seemed like the, the rogue actually pulled aggro on that very first pull there, because otherwise the Deathly Shill sh cast should not be going into them if they already have threat. So. Oh, it's, it's on the primary target, like yeah. you're saying, yeah. So, I mean, with double rogue there, I mean, were they just not tricksing properly? Was he just running out quickly enough? So isn't there like a threat drop once you kite away like a certain amount of yards or something along those lines? No, not that. Well, the, the only thing that happens is once you leave melee range, your, uh, your threat threshold that you need to pass goes from 10% in melee to 30%. So it, te it technically makes it a bit easier for melee to rip some aggro. But I mean, with a prot warrior and double tricks, it's just, I mean, there's, there's no way that should ever happen. Yeah, man. It just seems like they need to be able to, both sides need to be able to look in the mirror and get themselves together, splash some water in their faces before we move on to game two here, which I believe we are going to be going into a tall Dazar, so not a dungeon that has been too known for as heavy of wipes or as dangerous of pulls here, but for now, that's right. <laughs> we'll be back right after this break to see a game two between both these teams. Don't go anywhere. Battle for Champion somehow made their way out of King's Rest in one of the bloodiest dungeon runs we've seen so far in this tournament. But now we're moving on in a fresh start as we go into game two here on Atal Dazar, which is one of the time trial maps, which again, Battle for Champion dominated compared to their opponents in a company here is ironic. But does it really matter after that performance in King's Rest? Yeah, King's Rest was also a time trial dungeon, so you kind of hope they'd have more practice. But looking at the times for this Atal Dazar, Battle for Champion once again does have a better time than Team of company and looking at the affixes and teaming skittish you have to like kind of wonder they did have a little bit of issues with aggro in that first pull in king's rest is skittish going to be an issue in a tell we don't really know yeah at this point i mean seeing some of those pulls some of the, the kiting how much their tanks were having to run around all over the place loot battle for champion really wants to step up into these pulls but 
some of their execution issues have just been all over the place. Uh, I mean, if there's any dungeon where they can't step up and be aggressive is this one. Teaming, skittish, really should be an almost non-factor for these teams. Uh, I mean, teaming, yeah, of course, they'll have to chew through some more trash. Uh, we're in a fortified sense as well, so those two play together. But again, we, we keep coming back to the skittish as a non-affix, and it really, really shouldn't be, especially with the amount of damage Prot Warriors put out. Both teams looking for a fresh start here as we enter into game two between Battle for Champion and a company. Thank you for accompanying me here, Salute. Ah, that, that, that's what you wanted to say. <laughs> um, as we can see, uh, Battle for Champion right out the get-go. Actually, both teams, I expect, will go up to the left, as we typically see uh, coming out of them, getting ready with that Bloodlust right here. Battle for Champion with a massive pull. Uh, I believe a double Confessor pull as well. Uh, triple Confessor? <laughs> oh, my like, goodness. This is a huge pull coming in from the team right now. Want to make sure that you interrupt the Fiery Enchants and all of the Mending Words and, of course, Bond Soundy's Mantles coming in from both the Confessors. They missed one of the interrupts right now meaning that all of the trash monsters, all the mobs here, will not be CCable or interruptible, but they don't care as they just do so much damage and chew through the entirety of that trash. Massive pull here. Yeah, we actually do see a similar pull on the side of a company, and we actually do see both Rustler Druids end up standing on that ledge in order to be able to bait out the Juggernaut uh, charge to where the Juggernaut doesn't end up leaving melee, giving you a little bit uh, better of a uh, time DPSing down. We actually do see Battle for Champion DPSing down that pack significantly quicker than a company, um, doing the exact same pull, getting the exact same count, as they do make their way through the instance, we do see Battle for Champion um, snapping those Sarids, as we like to call it, into that spot there. Basically, snapping occurs whenever you don't have like line of sight on the mobs. And we actually do see the same si thing on a company as well. Um, basically, whenever the Sarids or the Sky Screamers don't have line of sight on the tank, they end up just um, teleporting straight to the mobs. We actually do see some of the rogues tricksing the tank on the side of a company and getting the Sky Screamers right on top of them. The old snap, crackle, pop coming up here from Team and Company and the triple Sky Screamer as well. Something that uh, does cast the AWE fear, as we mentioned and you can uh, just lock it down with only one melee's worth of interrupts. That AoE fear only hits every 15 to 16 seconds, so perfect for uh, one melee to babysit and tend to. As a terrifying screech does hit there at the bottom and clips the Windwalker Monk, who's stuck uh, in that beautiful garden on the side there, so not the worst place, of course, to be stuck in a fear. Battle for Champion has proc their first reaping and pulled it directly into Razan, the what could be first boss of the dungeon. I say that, of course, because it is a very open concept dungeon between the first three bosses. You can do them in any order you want, but Razan now down to 16. 62% in this dungeon. Team doing well, of course, the line of sight, the AoE fear every 30 seconds, and also as much as possible, either Shadow Meld or a Vanish when the Fixate comes on one of the players so the boss remains stationary and you maximize that DPS uptime. And you actually do see a company um, get their first reaping at the instance as well. They end up pulling a Sarid pack into that reaping, and they actually did end up seeing people get incredibly low there. Obviously, no cheat deaths or anything proc'd, but you did end up seeing some cooldowns coming out on the side of a company as they do make their way through the rest of the instance. We do see Razan hitting 35% as it's getting melted by the, on the side of Team Battle for Champion here. Yeah, and one of the Sky Screamers, actually both Sky Screamers being pulled here as one of the rogues uh, with the Star Marker jumps up, make sure to interrupt the Sky Screamer on the way down, and they want to cleave it on top of the boss here. Of course, if one of these AoE Fears does go out and somebody misses their kicks, it would be absolutely disastrous for the team, so making sure that they well coordinate those interrupts as Razan derps below 20% uh, max health. Team of Company again doing another round of snaps here uh, in the direction of Priestess Alun Z's platform. They will probably proc actually their second reaping here and maybe take that into Razan. So we're going to have to exa uh, see exactly how they plan it. But Sky Screamer sitting here and the snap is particularly easy this week as the team drops down and immediately charges into Razan, who is pathing right below them. But the Windwalker Monk, perhaps a bit overzealous. I'm not sure exactly what killed him, if it was the fall damage or maybe he was the first one to connect with Razan. Nonetheless, death goes out, battle res goes up, and they will not have that available again for another six minutes or so. I have no idea what actually ended up killing that Windwalker Monk because the tank ended up getting that pretty dangerous bleed. On the side of Battle for Champion here, you have them dealing with the triple Sky Screamer pull with the Sarids here, making sure that they do get those um, fears interrupted. Obviously, like you said a little bit earlier, it only takes one melee kick in order to be able to get every single fear. And then on the side of the company, they do have Razan down to 75%, not killing it nearly as fast as Battle for Champion did whenever they pulled Razan here. Yeah, you know, and I'm gonna I'm gonna have a little uh, little comment here. Uh, I'm not really sure why they didn't opt to proc their second reaping into Razan. Mm -hmm. Razan's really not that dangerous of a boss. We're in a fortified setting. It's just a huge, essentially meat target here for them right now. They uh, they, they line of sight. They constantly vanish in shadow meld. Razan is mostly stationary that you just waste so much efficiency that could have been used pulling the second reaping pack on top of Razan for Team and Company here. So, not really sure about that play. Nonetheless, Battle for Champion has moved up into the wing towards Volcall and dealing with some of these very dangerous honor guards and, of course, the shield bearers that just deny so much damage with their bulwark of Juju. 
Yeah, the Bulwark of Juju obviously needs to get, um, it can't get displaced, it needs to be either like uh, Paralysis or Stunned or Gouge or some sort of hard CC like that. We do actually see the Honor Guard go down inside of Battle for Champion, making the tank's life a little bit easier as he doesn't have that um, immense dot on him. The Shield Bearers of Zul need to be making sure that they are in range of the tank as they do cash the sh Shield Bash on the nearest target if there is no tank in melee range. Uh, so we would see melee go down if the tank ends up having to kite this back. We actually do see two Sky Screamers pulled on the side of a company while Razan is at 37%. And like you were saying before about them not pulling reaping, about a company not pulling reaping into Razan, another thing to take note is that uh, Outlaw Rogues actually do get a, a decent amount of single target damage by having multiple targets to hit by the trait Keep Your Wits About You, and them just not having multiple targets for a large majority of Razan ends up costing them, as we do see Volkal pulled on the side of Battle for Champion here. Yeah, and it looks like Team and Company is finally opting to proc their second reaping, but with Razan at 20% health, they haven't even proc the reaping yet. Some of his does have travel time to even get down in the first place, so not really really sure how um, much efficiency they're going to get out of it, but Battle for Champion has proc their second reaping on top of Volkal Phase 1. Um, also not the most efficient, uh, although they're trying, just because Volkal does spam heal himself in this first phase, so until all three totems die at the same time in order to proc Phase 2, any damage done to Volkal is really just padding, quite frankly, at this point, something uh, Nagura would know a lot about. So they're looking to kill off the rest of the reaping pack here now that Volkal has spawned at the second phase and the three animation totems have gone down. Here comes Volkal. They will slight... Uh, they will slowly need to kite along the room to make sure that they don't fill up the room with this gunk too quickly, else they will run out of real estate. Yeah, we actually did see the reaping trickling in on the side of a company a little bit late. They ended up having to deal with it, just wasting precious seconds after Razan died. Like you said, just not being efficient with their cleave. On the side of Battle for Champion, Volkal is actually getting pretty low here, as he does do a pretty sizable amount of damage to himself over the course of the fight, just due to the dot that he ends up putting on himself. Yeah, certainly uh, there's a reason you don't really see Bloodlust come up on this boss, and uh, just a, a fair bit of damage done to Volkal himself. The same kind of pulse that happens onto the group, nothing too dangerous now. They will want to make sure that by the time he dies, he is nowhere near the entrance of the room. Else, uh, once he dies, that kind of spike wall will go down and will uh, allow you to proximity aggro the very dangerous double honor guard pack on the outside, something that teams kind of avoid at all costs. We can see the Ring of Peace go down defensively here for the side of Team of Company as the, uh, the tank tries to get not too far away, but a lot of damage going out as one of those rending bleeds goes out on Ash instead of the active tank that was not in rage, just proccing that cheat death right now. Lexi barely getting uh, getting him quite healthy again, but just has so much damage going on. 6% now, and Ash barely holding on as the tank has his own rending bleed to take care of, and two more shield bears come in. 5% on the tank. Just so much damage going out. Lexi's falling behind. The Windwalker finally falls. It's going to stop their damage a fair bit on this trash as nobody's interrupting the bulwark of Juju right now, and just as disastrous for the team as HT is about to proc his cheat death as well. Alright, so it looked like the tank actually ended up going down on the side of a company to that honor guard bleed and he ended up having to run back which was how we did see ash with that um dot on him on the side of battle for champion we actually see them doing a pretty sizable pull with uh, multiple stalkers multiple shield bears and multiple hexers here making sure that they get the hexers kicked um obviously their cast is very scary and will end up going on random targets and could it potentially one shot them but they end up doing that pack really well and cleaving it down uh, really well here we actually do see battle for champion electing to snap some of these mobs on the spot on top of their tank as we do actually see um one person go down on the side of battle for champion and two rogues dipping incredibly low proccing their cheat death while on the side of a company they make their way to Volcal. Yeah, so that snap just did not work out in their favor as much as uh, you'd think. The swords were kind of airborne already, it seems, so their cleave and clip damage AOE when they do and when they snapped still connected with the melee and the rogues once they had actually arrived to the snap point. So really dangerous there. Essentially three deaths, but fortunately rogues do have that cheat death available to them, but won't have it for the next six minutes now because of that as they're about to proc their third rave of... Uh, wave, excuse me. Uh, rave, I suppose, as well. Reaping <laughs> as at 60%, looking immediately to drag it into some effective trap just up ahead in the direction of Priestess Alunzi. A company now, first phase of Volkal, and the totems are down to about a third health each. Yeah, and here comes the rave for Battle for Champion here, um, as they do end up pulling the Sky Skyscreamer and the Sards here. They end up looking like they ended up shadow melting off some of their reaping in order to be able to not have to deal with it. It's just uh, inefficient, uh, especially if you don't have to deal with the whole entire set of reaping, but it's not super scary to end up being able to deal with. On the side of a company, they end up activating Volkal by killing all three of those totems in sync, and Volkal is starting to take damage here. 
here. He ends up, like we said a little bit earlier, doing a pretty sizable amount of damage to himself. What we do see on the side of Battle for Champion, the tank charging into this auger pull, making sure that he's in melee range and kicking the um, kicking the cast so the augers don't end up free casting. Because basically, once your tank is in melee range of the augers, as long as he doesn't have to kite for prolonged periods of time, and if, if the first kick or if the first cast gets kicked on the auger, then the auger will not recast as long as your tank is in melee. Yeah, it should be, not be a problem for them. And uh, but even honestly, uh, those fireballs just don't do that much mm -hmm. damage. But certainly don't want any uh, residual splash, especially with uh, some quite vulnerable melee right now, as they don't have those cheat deaths available. Uh, rearing up to do what will be a likely very sizable pull upstairs. We see a huge trash uh, combinations up there with off in the fourth reaping wave for battle for champion. Uh, team of company, of course, not to be forgotten at 15% for Volcal. Uh, they have killed the three totems in sync and are about to say bye 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 to Volcal. 5% on the board here as uh, Battle for Champion moves up through the Fire Gauntlet. 78% on the board, so just uh, one more mob death, and they will be able to combine their fourth Reaping Wave with a lot of this trash that stands guard on the way to um, Priestess Alunza. Now, because it's teaming week, meaning there are more trash monsters present in the dungeon and you need to kill more trash monsters to reach your percentages, there's a Confessor and an Augur in that pack as well. Usually there's only an Augur, so Confessor, you want to make sure you're interrupting not only the Mending Words that heal people, but we saw they failed the Interrupt the first time. If that one some these mantle goes off that huge protective bubble once again it will make all the trash immune to crowd control and interrupts yeah we actually do see the tank on the side of battle for champion um, ending up dropping in one of those pools of uh, blood um, this black liquid that we actually do see on the ground and he ends up um, killing the confessors with those as we do see the reaping um, coming in for battle for champion they actually have not elected to use their bloodlust yet which makes me think that they might end up looking to be using it for yasma towards the end of the instance um, it kind of makes a little bit of sense to be looking to use it for yasma with a triple melee lineup as um, um, the soul rins on Yasma end up not allowing you to have a ton of uptime with the triple melee group. But at, at all in all, that looked like that pull was like super scary for Battle for Champion, but they ended up making it look not as bad. Yeah, it, uh, honestly, if you have this pull under control, then in terms of raw DPS gain uh, against Priestess Alunzi, you waste your bloodlust often just mm -hmm. because she kills herself essentially uh, through her transfusion cast at 100 energy. You're not going to skip an entire wave of transfusion by popping the bloodlust. So as long as you can kind of hold on to it, make sure nobody is dead just because of the immense danger coming in from the fourth reaping wave plus combination of the trash in front then you certainly have a nice benefit and bonus having access to the bloodlust for the final boss two more mobs here of course are pulled on top of alunzi right now uh, to make sure that they're cleaved down just sub 100 percent for their fifth reaping wave and team of company unfortunately has uh, had a full wipe on their side going up from three to eight deaths right now another 25 percent on the board uh, excuse me 25 seconds on the board plus the run back time so a bit unfortunate for their uh, for them, their uh, tattles. Yeah, they're definitely um, wasting a lot of time by dying there. Like a full wipe. <laughs> a full That's, wipe is not exactly is... what you're looking for, especially whenever you're already behind this far um, on the side of a company. I didn't actually see what ended up sending them down, but we do see on the side of Battle for Champion, everybody hopping in those pools, making sure that they do get that debuff on them as the transfusion does come out and Priestess Lunzi ends up killing herself. Battle for Champion making their way through the end of the instance as they are sitting at currently 98% trash count. So it looks like they only need about one more Sky Screamer in order to push them over the edge. Yeah, so what we see typically here what teams will do is pull the Sky Screamer over to um, the final yeah, the final boss's room, Yasma, and kind of just crowd control it on the side. Now, I believe in their case, they've actually killed both of the size, uh, Sky Screamers, so they probably won't have one to drag with them, and what they will do is kill Yasma and then return to the middle of the room and kill the four small swords patrolling with the uh, two Triceratops and, of course, the uh, Dinomancer or the Dino Handler there. Uh, each sword is 0.5%, so you're going to reach that nice 2% that they require for their trash. Nonetheless, they rush right up to Yasmo's platform, uh, the spider boss here, and prepare uh, to get in action as they pop Bloodlust right away and start to move around the room together uh, as much as possible. They don't want to spawn too many spiders in stray areas. Yeah, since they are so far ahead, I actually don't hate the idea of them not pulling that Sky Screamer oh. into the room, but it actually does end up coming in, and it looks like it was so close to fearing the whole entire yeah. group with that screech. Um, so the, you do see it get a paralysis out in the corner while... Um, Battle for Champion is DPSing down Yasma here with Bloodlust, making sure that they are able to get these Soul Rins out of melee, because if the Soul Rins do hit Yasma, it would likely be a wipe at this point. On the side of a company, they have ended up pulling that Augur pull, uh, making sure that they are able to just face tank in order for the cast to not be going off uh, on everybody. And just look how much damage is coming out of Jack right now, out DPSing the Prot Warrior and almost matching the healing of the Prot Warrior, so really having a lot of trust in the amount of mitigation, just self-sustain that comes out of their tank so that he can get as much damage in during this wave, uh, during the Bloodlust 
early going on. Finally, Yasma low enough for the team to consider pulling the Sky Screamer as they go and break it and uh, run it over to Yasma's. 47% left on this final boss as a Ring of Peace nicely prevents those images from reaching the boss, but a bit of disaster here as one of the spiders connects with the melee. We can see the shadow pool on the ground there. It does a huge amount of damage on a hit and also leaves a pool that does a substantial amount of damage. Fortunately, no deaths for them, but that was a close call there, Tettles. I mean, I don't actually like them pulling the Sky Screamer with them being this far ahead. That was really early. Yeah, like, okay, so the boss was at 50%, and we actually saw the tank end up pulling the Sky Screamer while all three of the melee are trying to deal with those Soul Rend adds. The Soul Rend adds, obviously, if they connect with the Asthma, you're going to end up wiping. So it, it ends up just being super hectic over the course of the whole entire group because you do actually end up needing to get kicks on the Sky Screamer consistently. As we do see all those adds go down, Yasma sitting at 15%, looking like it's going to be going down here in a second. We do see on the side of a company them wiping again. Uh, wiping as they had popped that Bloodlust too, so it was a super disastrous situation for them, but uh, too little, too late nonetheless as Battle for Champion uh, starting to look more like themselves, unlike the uh, last Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde dungeon that we had before. Battle for Champion, only one death on the board, and commandingly takes the second map to win the series 2 nothing, Mr. Jack. Now this is the Battle for Champion that I remember seeing from earlier. Very great win for them of taking that Atalazar and the series moving on to the upper finals here. It's ironic, that was, a, what a way to bounce back. That they really needed to make sure they seal that win and keep showing why they are that number one seed. Right, that's what you really have to look for with these teams that are on the top, right? Not, you know, everyone can hiccup and stumble and fall down. But it's, it's the really good teams that are able to bounce back, have a super clean run like they were, and it didn't really look like they held back at all either. In, the, in that last boss when Jack was popping off on the damage meters, we are like, wait, what trinkets is he running? And we noticed he's just running two DPS trinkets. Like, they didn't even back off at all. They, they knew exactly they were comfortable going in with their strategy, and they just executed it to, to perfection, really. They, they must have been having a laugh of their own as they were going through the King's Rest and just kind of setting their mind at ease here a little bit, Saluda, as they just kind of bounced back and were able to put it together. Yeah, but I mean, you know, akin to what you're saying and also to what Big X is saying, you know, running those double DPS trinkets, this is this dungeon is really not very threatening. First of all, it's not the most dangerous dungeon that we know about, and the affixes are just not just... They're just, they're just not dangerous. Yeah. What can I say? So uh, running the double DPS trinket is not that crazy for me to see. Uh, but coming off the King's Rest, I mean, that one was a noodle scratcher. <laughs> It, it, uh, I'll feel you on that one. You're right about that one. But you will see Battle for Champion moving on in the series. They will be waiting for the winner between Buff War, Nerf Rogue, and Team D. He will meet them up in that upper finals. We still have Sun Sky and Full Screen waiting a little bit later in the lower bracket here. So next series coming up, Buff War, Nerf Rogue, and Team D going up against each other. And we're also going back to King's Rest, Tettles. Aren't, aren't you excited? I am definitely excited to watch this. Uh, basically, we need to make sure that all the teams are very clean inside of their King's Rest runs. We obviously saw it was the Game of Throws, of, as we d decided it was, um, between these two previous teams. So making sure that you actually just have a clean run. Uh, it doesn't have to be like blazingly fast, but it seems like that dungeon, specifically on these affixes, is more of a who makes the least mistakes, not necessarily who makes the more proactive plays. Yeah, and I guess we're, with how we've noticed development between Eastern, Western teams, something along those lines, at this point, Slut, it just kind of seems like we're looking at these teams and how well they can just get through it without the mistakes, like Tells mentioned, rather than how well they can innovate and start pushing the boundaries of their performance. I mean, we're, we're week two right now of East Cup, and then we have just one more week of each region. You know, it, it's, we're getting to a point where we need to start comparing these teams versus each other because that's what we're going to see at the global LAN. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, it's great to say, oh, you know, this team did really well within their region, and, you know, they took it slow, but they won because the other teams choked, whatever. But it's a bit, if they want the, the big prize money, if they want that first spot, if they want the bragging rights, it's going to have to be against what is the best in the other region. And right now, you know, between Abrakidaira, the two method teams, right, you know, the only team in the East, in my opinion, that can at least show that they uh, can hang with them is probably Team D at this point. And if you guys like to place your vote on who you think will win the next series, be sure to use the hashtags in chat for hashtag Team D or hashtag BWN to decide your vote going into this. After an incredibly bloody and sloppy King's Rest, Battle for Champion does seal up that series by taking the second game in Ataldazar. Now it's time for the other round in the upper bracket between Buff War, Nerf Rogue, in the Team D. Don't go anywhere, guys. The Mythic Dungeon International will return after this short break. 